Well, hello there. You may be wondering, Nathan, what are you smoking? The answer to that is a lower tier cigarette that turns out to have higher levels of nicotine, tar, and carbon monoxide. Why? Excise taxation on cigarettes has forced me to substitute to lower quality alternative consumption patterns, and this taxation will prove to have long-term disastrous health effects for consumers. This is just one of the many behavioral implications that comes to light when we examine the real effects of excise taxation. And today, I'll talk to you about why substitutes, such as this, absolutely matter when evaluating the real effects of behavioral modification taxes. Disfavored goods taxation as a form of behavioral modification is justified only by its ability to reduce overall consumption. And to do this, policymakers must be aware of behavioral complexities that exist in switching consumers to substitute consumption patterns. In the realm of discourse surrounding excise taxation, much conversation is focused around particular goods that are socially undesirable and easily justifiable on a political stage, such as cigarettes, gas, and soda. However, existing literature shows that these taxes are inherently regressive in nature, and money generated by these taxes works its way into the general budgets of taxing authorities to finance agenda items uh, that will benefit their constituencies instead of those that actually bear the tax. If you're a politician and have a consistent source of revenue, why wouldn't you exploit it to spend on things that bring you more value? In the case of the Master Settlement Agreement in 1998 with Big Tobacco, less than 5% of the $260 billion given to states was actually spent on healthcare-related expenses and anti-smoking campaigns, and the rest of it going towards other programs. You ought to find it damnatory that legislators are currently saying they're taxing a good to change behavior, but are knowingly extracting resources from a reliable and regressive source to finance other political agenda items. This issue is exacerbated by the fact that many studies are poorly conducted and don't truly consider substitutes. Many demonstrate reductions in soda intake as a result of taxation, but all of them fail to show how this impacts total health for a consumer. Who's to say that consumers aren't switching to, say, fruit juice instead of soda, which would show a decrease in soda consumption while maintaining total sugar and calorie consumption, the metric for which they're truly looking. My research proposes that substitutes matter because there's a trade-off between behavioral change and revenue generated on all taxes levied. If people are still buying a tax good, this is evidence that behavior change is not occurring, and we already know that money generated won't be spent on health helping consumers switch to healthier alternatives. We cannot observe both occurring unless we see money generated spent on programs to switch consumers. With this analysis, we must demand further policy to address legislators that seek to purport behavioral modification when in fact only revenue generation is occurring. If this doesn't take place, no behavioral modification will happen, and all that will change is that my tax money that will supposedly change my behavior is going to be used to finance middle class preferences. Thanks.